see here. Are we coming through loud and clear on the uh, future cannabis project? Everybody hear us over there? Looks like we're pretty good. How are we doing? Where's Dr. Anibis? Aren't you going to come up and hang out with us? You don't want to come up and stay up here. Jump in here. I mean, I can't awesome. leave, but I need to leave early because I'm going to go and get my booster shot. Okie dokie. Well, come on up. And in case you got something to jump into. Perfect. So, so uh, yeah, come up, hang out, chill out. And if you got to go early, that's fine. It is what it is. Uh, but we'll be happy to have you along for the ride. I'm sure Damon's going to, I'm going to lean on Damon pretty much, pretty hard for this because naturally, of course, we're interviewing him. Uh, which is very exciting. We got Corey over from the Resonate Re Universe as well. And, uh, all right. Hope you're doing well over in Future Cannabis Project. We'll say hi. I'm just gonna give a couple shout outs to Old Smoke Jolly and the usual crew over at the Future Cannabis Project. Thanks for tuning in here, in here on a Friday. It's always excited to have everybody along. And we have a very fun one today. We have uh, Dan, and I never learned how to pronounce your last name 100% perfectly. So how do you say it? Uh, just the G is fine. <laughs> Damien G. You're Damien yeah. G. Welcome, yeah. Damien G. Uh, you've been on the panel. When did you start join? When did you join the panel at the Dank Hour? Um, well, the first couple of episodes I was in there, right, and then uh, I really didn't come on officially until like I think it was late August. Yeah, give or take. Awesome, Corey. It's good to go. Yeah, I think that was about. Yeah, I think it was late August when you came in, kind of officially. You were in like a few episodes before that for sure i know that because i've been playing around with them and editing them uh and and doing that whole thing so it's been uh it's been a hoot a holler and a lot of fun we happen to have a great conversation yesterday and we'll have another one today now naturally uh everybody's got their own way so i'm going to be a little bit different about your interview than did anibus's interview then i'll do rj's interview everybody gets you're all special my special snowflake but we're all going to chat about it individually i'd like to shout out everybody in the audience that has come along here in clubhouse if you're not if you're a future cannabis project want to come over and say hi live ask a question live on uh this stage come on over to the clubhouse room making this happen and having us here so damon you yes, have sir. an incredible story um and 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 an in-depth one let's just start right from the beginning uh what was your first interaction with cannabis? When was the first time you got high? Uh, first serious one or like the high school experience? Uh, we can talk uh, about the high school experience. Um, yeah, start there. <laughs> uh, traditional thing, you know, buddies had a spare that were older than me, dragged, them, dragged me along with them. And then luckily enough, when I went back to school the hour later, uh the grade that was younger than me was writing like some ib exam math teacher came out and fuck he, uh, he's retired you'll never hear this um the math teacher came out and like uh, you know i looked at it looked at him stone cold in the face and i got my wish we didn't have class that day so that was cannabis until i got ran over by a car right like i grew up in a very conservative household where reefer madness at that like and at that point in time where society was it was just you didn't touch weed because it made you a second class citizen but then when i got into my motorcycle accident uh that was shortly after the parker decision came out and my doctors at that time they uh can, can you break down me. what the Parker decision is for those that aren't Canadian? Okay, and, so and know what that quite is there because it it was kind of the the first medical commission. Yes, yeah, yeah. So it came down in two thousand and one, and it uh, the justice system in Canada forced Health Canada to provide access to cannabis, right? So that's where legal medical cannabis actually originated from. And it wasn't an idea of uh, 
the government at the time, they were actually forced to create, you know, what was at the time called the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations or the MMAR. So that ruling came down and the program started in about 2001. Uh, it was virtually impossible to get doctors to sign you into that program. Uh, I, I had a little bit of help from the MS Society with uh, this, oh God, 60 page application, uh, wanting signatures from, you know, everybody and anybody and the doctors, they wouldn't sign it. But yet in the medical documentation on the back end uh, for my accident, they called my cannabis use, well, my marijuana use medical. So in essence, if I ever got into a problem, um, I would have been able to take, you know, my health file and just show it to the judge and go, you know, my, the, my use is medical right? I've got all these forms and everything. Yeah, I know there's this program over here, but this doctor said he won't sign it because he has no understanding of the dosage, uh, efficacy, or safety or quality, right? So that's kind of where I had to take that into my own regard. And, you know, I was a young dad at the time. And, and, and Damon, you were in, like, this was in, in, in like, rural Saskatchewan, no less, right? Like, pretty oh, yeah. conservative, <laughs> like, very traditional conservative. Like, I don't know, like, a lot of people in the audience throughout Future Cannabis Project probably aren't familiar with Canada as well. But the prairies are, like, your, your Texas Iowa. North. Yeah, your Texas North. Oh, no, this North, is your... Texas North, man. Like... <laughs> very classic. So, keep yeah. going. Sorry, I didn't want to, I just wanted to nope. set the, the stage nope. a little bit bit there for the understanding because yeah. a lot of people might come from a more liberal space for it through yeah no yeah it definitely wasn't uh liberal by any means and so like that kind of forced me to have to really focus on you know quality safety efficacy and then uh eventually my kids as they got older it was a lot harder to <sighs> kind of just rely on medical documentation you know i looked at it and i was like fuck if i get if i get pinched here i'm gonna have to spend 10 to fifteen thousand dollars fighting my case and luckily for me i found a new doctor that uh, he signed my documentation willingly so i was able at that point to really kind of step out more and as that happened, the people around me that found out that I was medical, you know, if they didn't agree with cannabis, I'd have. He decided that he wanted to put me on methadone. So I just got up and walked out of his office. Right. And then this new doctor, it, it, was, it was a lot easier, but it was also, you know, five, six, seven years down the line from uh, when my accident originally happened and I had all that documentation kick in. Right. So it's, I, I've been, since legalization, it got worse. Right. In the first six months um i felt like anytime i opened my mouth that you know i was getting challenged we're, on we're talking like full federal legalization yeah yeah, yeah 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 i mean so, like let's step back a little bit okay, and go I'm like what was that ahead. like you're getting a little bit ahead i think cause, <laughs> i mean you you, you jump like during that period of time, you, you also helped a lot. I mean, we were speaking recently and I wanted to bring up a story that I think was really awesome. And I don't know, maybe maybe we're in the same time frame here, um, but you were speaking about, you know, a local student who had a medical card. Are you able to talk, chat a little bit about that and dealing with that situation? Was that kind of like oh. post full legal or was this previous when it was still medical card? So, um, so this young guy that I know, uh when he was seven years old like he he had been throwing up constantly um and the parents were quite concerned and so when he was seven he went for specialized training up to a children or not training testing sorry uh to a children's hospital in saskatoon and uh what they found is that he was actually having 98 or 99 influxes a day and so the parents, uh, the mom in particular, really fell down the rabbit hole as far as uh, gastrointestinal 
and treating that with cannabis. So seven years, no, because he was about 13 when he got medically carded. So that's what, six years. Um, he finally got medically carded and the family started him on CBD uh drops uh cbn drops they would uh take hashish and bake it in the oven until and because uh, testing isn't very accessible in canada even well up until 2016 you had to be a federally authorized producer in order to have your cannabis tested they changed that in 2016 and opened up access to medical patients but again, you know, in 2016, it was extremely expensive. So the family, they figured that they would be able to cook uh, all the THC or metabolize all the THC off. And then they actually did spend, I think he told me it was about $2,500 to have this oil tested. And it came back in CBN, right? Their theory was, is that they were going to be able to take THC and metabolize it to CBD, but that's where they're like, no, this went to CBN for us, right? So this particular student, uh, when he was in what is like junior or elementary school out here, uh, so that's kindergarten to grade eight, uh, he was on CBD, had a Pax vaporizer, used oil at school, came home and would use the vaporizer. And then when he reached about grade nine, he... Uh, had a massive flare up and the parents looked they talked to the doctor and they started with low dose thc and you know this kid well is a young man now um he's in about grade 11 or 12 and he doesn't have a mark below an 89 uh last year it was the same situation he was able to it was kind so of like funny honor roll we, there then eh? like that's oh yeah that's like and he's he, he's he's so smart that he looked at it where his grades were at last year and realized that he did not need to write his finals and the parents looked at him and even i looked at him like he had three heads i was like man write the finals he's like i don't need to covid's been horrible i'm just i don't feel like doing it and so i'm not and so he finished that year with a 75 like straight across the board and it had he wrote his finals <laughs> right but the parents looked at it and they're like you know this he's very articulate and then this year you know his marks are he's got a 98 in one of his classes and his teachers are really they're aware because one of the principals from a few years ago had a big issue with the kid being medically carded there was other teachers in the high school that were openly discussing his medical use in front of other students and you know there was a change right so this year's a lot better right and he's doing really well he enjoys going to school and you know the parents can see that cannabis is really helping him maybe not so much with you know the gastrointestinal issues but he's a young man and he's lived in constant pain right so and that's kind of where i come in is you know the pain management side right so yeah <laughs> awesome so i mean like you got in a motor vehicle collision in 2001 and you and that was kind of what pushed you into this region and you were really not even in the cannabis space at this point in time whatsoever you just kind of <laughs> jumped into it uh well not jumped into it but we're looking for a, a relative way to help take care of yourself without having to take methadone or oxycontin and all these other <laughs> medications and i mean like what was it like so clearly being upfront opus and honest about cannabis and in that place and time like i imagine you became part of your community as like the guy that people represented like how did that transform into a different kind of stage to where you are now can you talk a little bit about that yeah i can okay so uh, i I kind of took more of a role as uh, like sitting on the sidelines. Um, the, the guy that taught me, uh, you know, and got me to the level that I'm at now. Um, he, you know, he was helping people medically. He would hire tremors and, you know, I looked at it and I was like, I'm getting, getting probably one of the best educations that I can money can, you, you, that you can get. 
right? So I never looked at it and I just volunteered. Like the, the extent of my activism over 18 years uh, was I would help a uh, guy with his plants so that, he, you know, if he was going to pay me, I was like, you know, just find somebody else, right? Like, I don't want the money you're teaching me here. Um, and then in 2012, uh, when they were looking at, well, when they ended the MMAR program and they were trying to take away, you know, the uh, individual's right to provide access to themselves, I bought a bong for part of a fundraiser, right? So that was really the extent of my activism. Um, I don't consider myself an activist. I just really deal with, you know, what situation's been put in front of me and, you know, try to handle it accordingly. So I always thought that, you know, like when legalization happened, because my day job wouldn't permit me, like I made a post there, there was the current grower at the time. He uh, was interviewed by a newspaper and and this is before the MMAR uh, coalition against uh, or coalition for repeal or whatever it was called was formed. But he made a point of saying that he couldn't compete. I can't compete with the people that are allowed to grow it for themselves. Right. And the problem, the reason why I never I like I bought one bag and a batch of seeds from that grower and it was the worst weed I've ever seen in my life. And then the seeds, when it went for time for extraction and making into hash uh, off of, you know, 300 grams of plant material, I got a gram of hash and it just didn't make sense to me. Right. So uh, he, he got interviewed and I made, you know, just underneath like people that I knew from the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club, they had actually sent this cannabis off for testing and it was really high in metals right? Like extremely high in metals. And uh, so I made, I just posted that information on that face. Holy shit, London. My boss flipped out on me. Um, there is, I live in a very small community and everybody was talking about me over one little Facebook post of being like, Hey, there's a reason why people don't want to buy weed from you. And it's over here, right? Like it's not good weed. So and it, and and the system was kind of set up at this point in time as like like you said that these small home growers like even the boy that you were mentioning earlier had limited access to testing and they were just having to do what they could it's very expensive it's very hard to get a hold of so it made it very difficult i i would imagine for anybody to be able to say hey this is quality or not so when it was finally able to be voiced out it was it's a good thing to do so so continue yeah yeah and it uh it caused me more grief in my life than i was like actually like willing to accept so that was kind of right where I, like you know there it's funny when you have somebody that's in a high level government position turn around and go yeah i saw that and like there was a lot of support but the haters got to me, right? And I just, I kind of was like, no, nah, you know, I kind of like what I'm doing, just sitting in the background, paying attention to what's going on and kind of just worrying about what was going on in my own garden rather than commenting on other people's, right? Because it's weed, the Frank Sinatra song, anything I can do, you I can, or you can do, I can do better. That's like for the most part, synonymous straight across the industry. And I think as soon as guys grab that, that we're all really fucking good at what we do, that's when you're able to like make really good friendships and stuff. So, and like, just if I can fast forward here. So like 18 years, I wasn't really active. People knew who I was, right? Cause I was medically carpeted. And it was kind of private and stuff. And then legalization happened. And it could have gone one of two ways for me. Uh, the first way that I was afraid it was going to go is that the the community that was in place was going to, you know, just be like, oh, you're a bandwagon jumper or an opportunist. Um, it actually went quite the opposite direction and the direction that I'm happy with and I'm glad with is, you know, I had a lot of the community be like, Hey, how's it going? You know, you've got a great story. 
And then all of a sudden, you know, universities and that started talking to me, which again became overwhelming as fuck because my my vocational training is uh, in like I'm a controller, right? So I deal with writing policies, dealing with government agencies, you know, doing uh, tax remittances and things like that. So it's just it's kind of really surreal for me to see where I'm at now. When I got ran over by a car, if I would be able to go back and be like, okay, Damon, this is what's going to happen. I'd be like, you're fucked. It. You're like, that's not what's going to happen. And now here we are. And it's what's happened. Right. And I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite happy with it. I love the community. Right. I really like how the community itself, you can recognize the really thirsty people. And like, you just, you, the old heads aren't dealing with the thirsty people. And the new guys with talent aren't dealing with the thirsty people. And it's, you know, that's something that has been kind of integral in the community, at least for like the last 20 years that I've been looking in or like knowing this guy or this guy is the second somebody starts trying to do it as a popularity contest. That's when shit goes sideways, right? Um, best one of the best pieces of advice i got from another grower when i was first starting out is just because you can grow cannabis it doesn't make you cool and that's 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 the truth right there right in fact it's so counterculture is the complete opposite of that <laughs> it's 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 awesome because it's kind of and i i i love the cannabis industry like we we got we fell into this conversation a little bit yesterday too which i love is is it's got this passion about it right like you don't you're not cool in the cannabis space until like you're not cool <laughs> i yeah i just i i love that point and you just got to kind of do what you do there's some amazing project that we get the fortunate chance to have on uh regularly and they're all just dank motherfuckers like yourself that have lived through it and i, I gotta tell you damien there's a lot of people that relate to your story and and I, I tell you like maybe not the best time right now to get zoned into that while we're having this conversation but there are a lot of great comments from the people who are who have dealt with the same thing are going through the same thing so i i really thank you for coming on and sharing the story because i think it's very important for people too and and it, it relates to a lot like myself as a as a medical ACM PR licensed person, uh, I've been using cannabis medicinally to mitigate the negative side effects of Ritalin. I'm ADD severely being medic. First thing you do when you're seven years old, right? What do you do when in, in 20, in 1990, in the 1990s, what was the first thing you did when you got diagnosed with ADD? Fucking you dope that kid up on some Ritalin. So I've been, I've yeah. been on Ritalin since I was like, like seven years old. And it's always been a counter. I was trying to deal with, uh, you know, the shakiness and then the lack of sleep and then all those other problems. And when I was 16, it was like I got I smoked my first bit of weed and it like it instantly mitigated every single one of those facts. And I'm not going to get into the exact story because it's not about me. But it's like th that story is just it's so universal in this space. And I think it also becomes that that anti anti-hero you know what i mean like we're, we're <laughs> kind of the anti-hero type of group right we don't want to see the by be the big boss to be really cool we want to see the person the small family you know that we want to go to the farmer's market like i was listening to um there's a there's a cannabis farmer's market in vermont right damon and yeah. like it's a farmer's market and how amazing is that like it's it's so culturally correct it's it's ridiculous. I remember in Vancouver, BC, you could walk down Granville Street on Thursdays and there would be tables set up with, you know, all these people selling their cannabis like openly. And this was kind of in that gray area when they announced legalization and then and 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 then just before it actually went full legal in the October of two years ago, right? Yeah. Um I had a really interesting okay tomato model 20 years ago that's that's what i envisioned and it's it's kind of disappointing because i didn't coin that phrase and sorry tomato what was this tomato model right you can buy tomatoes at a farmer's market you can sell tomatoes that you grew in your backyard to your next door neighbor right and that was kind of what I was hearing out of the activist community.
but now there are guys where big money got to them and now they're like oh we need we need we need <laughs> and it's just like uh, how many times has there been a court case where a judge has said you know the plant is benign right how many times has a health professional turned around and said it's a benign substance but yet we want to overregulate it and I, and I, I don't know like it kind of feels like biopiracy to me right but even myself i'm a biopirate because i don't really know really what indigenous tribe or where on earth this stuff came from right so it's it's kind of weird in that regard like you can't definitively say this region in Afghanistan, or, you know, we found Lake Pollen or pollen at the bottom of the lake in Lithuania. Right. I, or This is such a great segue to get it, it's a point to get into, because this is like your a big field of your life is ethnobotany. Can you define yes. that a little bit and talk about that a little bit more? This is just a, I okay. am so excited to hear about so, this. So it's uh, and that that's, you know, that's it just happened by fluke. OK. Um, when legalization started and I was coming out from the shadows, I guess, so to speak, and, you know, being more visible. Kind I had, of, uh, kind of visible. Yeah. I mean, you're kind still hiding I'm behind still, I'm plan. still, I still got, I still got a ways to go. Right. But yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Right. We've had that conversation. Um, so I kind of just at first I had no idea really what to call myself because like I was seeing, you know, the word or like, cause cannabis quality assurance or sommelier or like whatever it was. Right. And so I like kind of picked a bunch of different titles and then um, I had, I was lucky enough uh, through two of my friends uh, to go for dinner with Dr. Dennis McKenna. So I, I knew who Dennis and Terrence were. Um, I'm familiar with their work, and uh, but didn't at the point at that point in time, I wasn't a fanboy, right? Like, or I wasn't that into Dennis's work, right? I had no idea he was on the Joe Rogan podcast. So we were talking, and you know, I my my limitations of and lack of formal training. I used what I thought was the proper botanical term for something. And it, it was close, but it wasn't a word. And Dennis, he was so smooth. He just was like, huh? And I said the word again. He goes, okay. Right. Then I went home and watched, watched his Joe Rogan podcast where he talks about, you know, the hippie ethnobotanist and the living ethnobotanist, right? So my only, the only plant I know is cannabis. That's, that's it, right? Uh, my wife, she really understands like probably about 90% of the medicinal plants that grow around us. Um, she does have uh, some sort of certification from Cornell, but uh, for me, I just know cannabis, right? So that's where, after I watched that Joe Rogan podcast, I was like, okay, that's what I am. I'm a hippie ethnobotanist or a living cannabis ethnobotanist. And I limited it just to cannabis because that's all I know, right? And for a good portion of, you know, my being medical, I was always curious as to where did this plant originally originate from, right? It was like, you know, Maybe maybe one day they'll turn around and be like, okay, so this is an evasive species from a different world. That's why we made it illegal. Well, now 2018, we know that's bullshit, right? So it's it's and there's multiple theories, and, and you know there's there is scientific evidence backing up each one of these theories as to where did cannabis originate from. And I won't go into the details of that because every, you know, it's something that I've heard a thousand times. So it's that you're right. I've been trying to figure out where this magical plant origin, where is it truly indigenous from? Right. Because yeah. now we have, we have a ton of biopiracy going on. Right. And that's not right to the plant. That's not right to the people that have, made sure that there still is a plant right they tried to fully eradicate it and that didn't work 
right? So there is a huge level of, you know, ethnobotany just created from the last 80 years. And there is culture that is being, you know, silenced or shut out, right? You look at any one of our friends that's licensed up here. And it's, it's weird because I'm a type of guy that always second guesses myself and, you know, a lot of self doubt, but my friends that are licensed, they can't even open their mouth. I fear of losing their license or a million dollar fine. Right. So it just, it, it seems, it seems to me that, you know, they are trying to kill the culture that has been created or at the very least want to ignore it. Right. And I don't think that's going to be very successful. Did you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's, and that's the thing. It's the counterculture, right? It's why the, the there's going, I mean, what do you think? And I mean, this is kind of where we could start like living at this point in time and going like, what do you think about, the future, because I'm looking at cannabis and I there's going to be a Labatt's brewery. There's going to be that that mainstream, very easy to approach cannabis. But it, it, it creates a point of interest and education for your baseline consumer to get into the cultural stuff. So, you know, where do you see that slipping in smoothly? Because it's, it's, it's got to happen, right? There's got to be a consistent product or do you think it should be like we should just go instantly to craft how do we bounce through that segment like we've kind of not done in in north american culture like we can't in canadian culture like typically when you look at, at prohibition of alcohol and it being re permitted again you had like federal control and then the main centralization of alcohol and then now you know 40 50 years later the culture is different. There's craft, there's community. You can have more access to local ingredients. There's education, there's knowledge, but that's taken a long time of growth and development. But I also feel like maybe a little bit of government expression happened in the process. How do you feel that is in relation to cannabis and how do you see that industry moving forward? I hate alcohol analogies. I, I do, <laughs> I do too. But I don't, don't look at it like an alcohol analogy. Don't. Look at it like a look at like look at it like um like um a prohibition analogy. Like not like not like the analogy of the substance because I don't think you could ever correlate cannabis to alcohol because alcohol's like I don't need to get into the details of that. But I mean the process of legalization and education is more what I want to focus on because I I don't think you. Well, okay, so like, there's two ways to look at it, right? And it's, it, this is kind of loaded, but on my end, it's like I'm gonna give a loaded answer here. <sighs> look at the amount of violence and stuff that uh, played out around solely alcohol, right? Uh, 45 minutes away from the town I live in, um, there's actually it's referred to as Little Chicago. Uh, Al Capone had tunnels. It was a complete bootlegging city. There's a lot of crime, a lot of violence. Okay. So cannabis users, the most patent, like even growers, right? Like, yeah, we're extremely competitive, but when it comes down to it, we're the most passive people on earth. Right. So that's why, like, I look at it and I'm like, you know, the alcohol thing is, is, is like, I understand where you're coming from and it's the most common thing to like kind of compare things to. What I want to ask is, do you know who grows the potatoes for McDonald's? No, you don't. I do because you drive through the town, you know where they're growing, but like McDonald's isn't hyping up their tomato growers. They're hyping up the brand, right? So with commercial cannabis, yeah, your your you know huge conglomerates, they're probably not even going to grow the cannabis and just slap their label on it, put billions into marketing, and and do it that way. You, you think it's going to go white label culture? It's because I don't because you in, don't in, think in, the that, in that in that regard, right? So tomatoes are white labeled culture. Potatoes are white labeled culture, right? But my father-in-law, he's been growing tomatoes for 40, or potatoes for 40 years. His potatoes are awesome. They have the thickest skin on them. Like, they, they destroy 
anything that you can get from the market. And that's what's going to happen is there's going to be, you know, not everybody, well, yeah, not everybody is going to grow their own cannabis. Uh, I've seen from legalization to now in the last three years where I live, probably, you know, in a community of 2,500, there's maybe 100 people growing their own cannabis now, right? And they're, and they're having good success. Uh, that I, you know, am aware of, I'm the only, like, so MMAR injunctive holders started at about 30,000. And I've heard that has dwindled down to about 700 people who are still covered under federal injunction. Uh, medical growers that I'm aware of, now, well, yeah, see, that's now. Um, starting out, in my area, I was in the town I live in. Oh, I could, I can say fairly confident that I was the first one because I made a lot of people's heads explode, right? But then, I mean, like after, three years ago, how many years ago do you before think there were? legalization? Uh, you know, maybe a half dozen to up to a dozen, right? Not very many in re, like in the city, yeah, there was lots right like uh, you look on health canada's website as far as what the grow numbers were but when i first got licensed there was only seven in the province of saskatchewan and then the next year it was like 200 right because it slowly picked up steam yeah and then all of a sudden it's okay you find out about it because i mean i i tell you what i was so nervous applying for mine because it's like all of a sudden you don't know what red flags are gonna go up you're literally just saying hey government i'm growing cannabis in large volumes and even to this day with stigmatism it feels nervous doing it and and you've been doing it from 2001 do you still get that same kind of like oh i gotta renew my license I don't have to renew my license. Oh, your grandfather. My, my regulations, my regulations are uh, protected by virtue of court order until further notice from the court. So that's me. <laughs> I don't have to renew. Um, I, I, to be honest, my doctor, like when I had to renew, I was going like, you know how they're like, you got to renew every eight weeks or eight weeks early. So just so I didn't get hung up without a license, I was in my doctor's office and he was signing every eight weeks and we were renewing every eight weeks, right? Just, just so, to be sure. Yeah. That's, squeaky that's, wheel. That's, squeak, 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 squeaky wheel, right? Like, <laughs> so. Um, I think I, that's I, a really good point that you, like, that you highlight on and that you've really managed to do through your time that is, is, is really valid is that you've got to, like, in these legal markets, it's not necessarily 100% about, like, well, I mean, you got to follow the rules, but they're words, right? They're open for interpretation. So you're, you're able to use that advantage to further, you know, oh, what yeah, you're doing. Yeah. You're going to keep it squeaky clean and follow the rules as tightly as possible. But you're also like using the rules to your advantage. It's it's very advantageous. That's a great thing about Canadian government. Like you mentioned, when when what was the what was it again? The the original bill to allow home growing, medical growing in medical marijuana access regulations. And marijuana was spelt with an H. <laughs> yes, the very terrible, like the the like just straight up. I had, I had I had theories about that, whether they were right or not nothing's been disproven right like so i've heard everything from uh the reason why it was spelled like that is because marijuana with a j is a botanical plant and if they turned around and spelt it with the j uh they they would in, in essence make it illegal for the government to possess cannabis Right. Like just and that's that's your stoner anecdotal bullshit that like or hippie ethnobotanist stuff that is the good thing about legalization is you have these PhDs now giving guys like me a crash course. Right. And like you have PhDs that recognize that, you know, expertise you know, comes over time. 
and you know they're just yeah you just need a little bit of help with the language and the right which is fine right well no it's it's been interesting and with the dank tower and these panels that we try and do in connecting with people is we get the the experts in with the doctors and talk about the subjects and try and make those connections and like i don't know about you but i've like i learn everything i, I learn at least a dozen things every episode and it allow and it, it's a great avenue for people to make that connection i mean how when you were looking at like reversal spray for cannabis right like that was a paper done in like what 1990s or something like that for using or sts or colloidal silver spray and yeah. like it wasn't even when was when did you start hearing about it within the cannabis community uh, i mean in rural saskatchewan no less by the way well, the canadians are loving the, the um reversing in that uh, it was see clark mentions it right and i'm looking for the book so i can find the page but it's not sitting in front of me i'm, I'm pretty sure clark mentions like uh, reversing somewhere along the lines uh what's really kind of been interesting is about 10 years ago um i started looking at the stuff that was done in russia in 1912 right not much of it is translated into English, but that's kind of where, like, I work with a bunch of hemp farmers, and it's funny because they always want to tell me that it's a different plant, and I just laugh my ass off because it's the same fucking plant, buddy, right? Like, you're 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 looking at this and going, oh well, because it has CBD, and like having farmers understand that if they grew their hemp the same way that I grew my cannabis and I wasn't hitting it with Roundup or pesticides and, you know, like it's going to, it's going to grow differently and will grow like my plants. And I had one hemp farmer tell me I was wrong to my face. It was like, fair point. Okay. Whatever. Right. Um, and then I went back the next season and yeah, he did 500 plants as an orchard and he's like, look at all this CBD I have. And I was like trying to explain to him that, you know, if you, you that that sticky resin, it's the same thing. And he doesn't, he, he can't really grasp that even the commercial CBD that's available is, is, is it's the same type of license. Now, the Health Canada guys that are in the commercial system they're able to do some really crazy stuff so they can take a balance strain, separate THC and CBD and sell them in whatever form they want as an extract, right? So he's just not, it's funny because the hemp farmers aren't there yet, right? They, they still think it's a completely different plant and yeah. <laughs> There's no, I mean, you know, I, I had an awesome conversation and I, I'm sure you've chatted, if you happen to have an opportunity to chat with Anne about it and read her paper too, it's really interesting because there are like, it's not divergent enough to be a separate species, but there are like, you can, you can like take it and sample it out and test for like a, a epigenetic markers for them, right? Like there, there, there's a separate they have a separate grouping of markers that are pretty consistent, at least in cultivated ones, I believe. But anyways, you'd have to read her paper. I don't want to quote her and get things wrong. To, it's to the say same that. plant. It is. It's exactly the same plant. It's not divergent <laughs> as a species. But I wonder, like, because you could technically continue to breed things separately. Would we be able to do so over, you know, another 150 well, years? Especially no. with the fact that cannabis... Like if you look at the turnover rate of cannabis, you can do four crops a year and and and, and go, do four turns and develop, you know, four times a year. That's kind of there's not a lot of plants that you can evolve that quickly through selective breeding. Right. You know what I mean? Like, would it be possible? Probably not. Uh, maybe in 100 years or so. Um, with the CRISPR editing that's going on, there are companies that are working on this. Uh some started in like shit 2015 or something like that. Uh, what I'm afraid of is so Health Canada, they gave a strain out called MS 17. And it was almost like this plant was selected so that you couldn't extract it. Um, like, or do any extra, like extraction yields were garbage, right? Like you'd have, and the, the potency level 
was about 15% and they'd top out at that, right? So myself, what I'm afraid of seeing is that with, you know, GMO, right, because that's what it is, is that you're going to end up seeing, you know, the ability to grow your own at home disappear, right? And you're going to get into a situation where, companies you know like they'll be able to tell genetically where that plant came from and then you know ask the question how did you get this right so that's what i'm afraid of technology move right so is it going to be more like five years when we start seeing that and they get really competitive and again it comes back to this bio piracy that went on right so that's that's kind of what I'm afraid of. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. I mean, uh, I'm. It's an interesting phase that we're at, and it's kind of like really fun to be at this crescendo. Like, if you if you look at what's going to happen in the U.S., so you're probably going to be federally legal in the next few years. Um, and and then Europe will follow suit quickly if they don't hit it hit it on the nose like pretty much soon. I think Portugal and there's a few countries on the way very quickly, and and it's going to grow and like plant the seeds and develop very very quickly. It's kind of it, it's interesting to be at the front of this space and seeing all of these amazing things happening and the potential that it has with it, but also the the weird framework that's been created to kind of mitigate these potential. I mean, in Canada, just so everybody's aware, whether they're American or, or Canadian or, or wherever you happen to be, provincially, there are some, some laws and municipally it, it's changed. But I think in general, in Canada, every person is allowed to grow four cannabis plants at home on their own. It, we, I, I'm a licensed grower, so I'm able to do a hundred. Um, but I think you can get pretty large ones that are available out there too. So I did want to give an opportunity for people on the stage or in the audience or over in the amazing uh, Future Cannabis Project area to come up, uh, ask a question and uh, of our you know, amazing Damon. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a brain fart. The rain is trickling here. And it's just like, and I'm in a greenhouse too. So it's very relaxing. And now I'm starting to lose focus. But that's beside the point. So if you want to come up and say hi, raise your hand, come on up. Otherwise, Damon, what are you smoking and what did you harvest for fall? And what are oh. you most excited? I mean, you guys, yeah. we, we, we didn't touch on everything either. We could really jump into like your genetic breeding area because we kind of glossed over that a little bit. You're you're a bit, bit of a seed junkie, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's never, yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you a story when it's not being recorded, and you're gonna laugh your ass off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so what, do you have anything you're excited about planting soon? You, you mentioned that you're gonna, you, you uh, have to yeah. Up. I got I got my hands on, uh, I got my hands on a few things that uh, I've wanted for quite some time, like ten years, and. Uh, <sighs> Yeah, last year I ran through nine nine different strains, and I'm only keeping one. So it's I've got some room that I've got to fill. Um, but by by running by by keeping them, are you keeping things in like seed form? Or are you keeping them in cuts? Very, cuts? I think I might have to send you something to play with. Cuts, cuts. I love. Yeah, it's. I've always been perpetual. Uh, never kept them on, and uh, I had one strain that actually went for nine years, and then she became unstable as fuck. <laughs> so I was able to, and luckily enough, you know, I had multiple clones. So when the one went atavistic on me, um, yeah, I found the one that you know I found one that wasn't herming out and was able to cross it um so that's that's nice and then i ended up with polyembryonic seeds out of that so so wait wait, wait. so wait, wait. you 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 kept a strain going for nine years through perpetual so you're like you would just cut before you flipped it into flower a fresh one out of it yeah yeah and i don't i like i don't flip until i've got roots right so as soon as roots happen then it's a two-week process of getting that plant ready 
to flip, right? So you got to harden it off, and, you know, do all those things, start backing off one, you know, one element and increase the other ones, right? So I don't want to go too much in depth in it because there's I, way, the, the, there's fertigation guys on our panel that can answer that shit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then here I got I got a great one from Future Cannabis Project. Actually, Peter's wondering what cultivars did you run and what did you what did you end up keeping? What didn't you like about the previous ones that you didn't keep, and what did you like about the one that you actually kept? Um, so this one called Black Dreams. Fucking amazing, amazing work line. Uh, good yield. So like 1,400 grams dried, right? Like fucking amazing yield. Um, you know, and I... What, like, what type I of, really, like what size set? I, I've seen your setup yeah, a little bit, but yeah, like I don't, you're doing I don't, like... I don't really want to plug the brands I work with because like I fucking hate it when dudes come on the internet and they're like, well, Mars Hydro. And like, I'm just like, fuck, man. I, I don't spare any cost, right? And uh, I never have. It's always been cheaper to, you know, dump 2,500 bucks into a light than buy $2,500 worth of weed right so in that regard um and basically they're home appliances right yeah so you're not gonna buy you're not gonna buy a gas stove from china <laughs> oh, right no, but yeah, we, let's get right? back to the cultivars though like what okay. else did you um what else did i run uh gelato 33 that uh it got fucking sick as hell and so I uh, did some things to nurse that back to life. And I did that outside kind of regret not cutting a clone from it. Cause it's really good, <laughs> like really good. Uh, and then uh, another one called green spirit and that one was uh, susceptible to issues. So I'd like to just keep it simple, right? Like knock on wood. I, don't have problems with PM, but that's also because where I live, the relative humidity rarely will crack 45. Like we're not humid here. We're dry and arid. So uh, it, uh, the reason why I kept it is because it's good, right? Like it, it tops out at that 21, 22 big yield. Um, and uh, so I'm running that in like, yeah, out of a 50, square foot room i got 1400 grams but i'm running oh, 3000 watts of light right and so the other thing is is i i use smaller pots but i like to spread my plants out as much as possible right yeah and then you're doing the like part, a, the, a pretty long veg time then eh? like what's your uh, uh, yeah yeah my outdoor plants were cut as clones october 12th and uh they went outside may 1st and i cut down october 12th this year so they were a year old um yeah i like my long veg cycles right so when health canada and it was i kind of i kind of giggled right because when they were looking at legalization they didn't want to let people have plants more than a meter tall it's like, well, first outdoor, that's, you know, like I have a buddy, first time grower, his plant was nine feet tall because it was trying to reach over the top of the sun to get or top of the house to get all that light. Right. So it's, uh, I'm grateful that they didn't introduce that. You know, I am happy with legalization because it gives me the opportunity not to, you know, like I could always become a designate for somebody, but it gives me the opportunity to be like, here, have a joint, right? And not like that's, and it added four plants, you know, like my licensing's for indoor only. Um, and the reason for that is, is because growing out wheat or growing wheat outside where I live, it's a, it's a miracle that I eat and have you know like plants we get 90 or we get 75 mile an hour winds up here uh so it's it's night i i'm disappointed because the gelato did really well outside really well outside the other one not so much it uh it was it just grew bad right no airflow so you, you know and then you're looking at bud rot happening because 
by the time I cut, like last year at this time, you know, and ideally I would have liked to have cut, you know, October 15th or later on, but the weather was getting so cold. And right now it's, uh, I think, 17 Fahrenheit outside, if my math is right. It's minus eight, right? When you wake up in the morning. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I, nothing, I, nothing. I, I, I'm like in Vancouver in a greenhouse right now and it's 25 degrees <laughs> and I just like, and I, and I have this greenhouse going all year long and it's like Canada. It's like this one little spot in Canada where you can get away with this. And, and I just hear about everybody else talking. It's like, Oh yeah, well it was like nine minutes eight last night. And the, the, the permafrost is starting and it's, it's like, yeah. Yeah, what people don't understand is like, it, it, you throw cannabis outside in Canada. It's, it's a, it's a shot in the dark, right? Like the, 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 I've, I've seen some people do it, but most of what I've seen for outdoor cannabis has come through with any success. It's always gone into the production of hash or extracts um, just because it's just, you can't mitigate when you have those type of winds um, and like you're in the prairies, right? So we're talking bottom out humidity. This is not the place that these plants typically grow at. So a lot of people will throw it out over all of and stuff like that. But if you're throwing, if you're doing um, if you're doing like photo period plants like gelato, like these long spacing indicas, in fact, if you got any, I'm very impressed with them. I think that's pretty awesome. And those were definitely some strong genetics. Do you do you have anything you're looking forward to next? Like what are you gonna what would you like to put in the ground next? And what are you looking for exactly? The the uh, the, the, the nerds on Facebook, uh future cannabis products, lo love to hear the name. Blue yeah, I know that. That's why I love this channel, man. So yeah, shout out to FCP. Um, Blue City Diesel, like that, the Blue God crossed with the New York City Diesel. That uh, that's something I'm excited about. Uh, Blue Cross is another one. What else do I these have? are all off of Blue Dream? Kind of is that where the? No, uh, it comes from Jordan of the Islands. Oh and, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've run some Good of joke. his stuff before. I've had some good, good, good alcohol. Um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I also, I'm a huge fan because I've got a lot of friends that are like, here, check out these seeds. And I'm like, this is straight up bagweed. And I enjoy bag seed. I don't cut it. I don't propagate it. It's, th those are one runs, right? So I've seen the, the more interesting expressions have always come from the bag seed right but just myself personally like the guy the guy who taught me how to do what i know i the very first time i'm like oh i'm gonna take strawberry cough and cross it with dj shorts blueberry and he got really really angry with me and explained the principle of true breeding and what my responsibilities were right and clark covers this off in his book um my buddy has the bedside, like I've got, I'm blunt and I have bad bedside manner. Um, but my buddy's kind of like a rhinoceros, right? Like he doesn't pull any punches and it's just, that's, that's how it is. Right. So most of the interesting stuff that I've seen has come from, you know, hermaphrodite, possibly hermaphroditic bags well right? i mean i like i love that term hot like her hermaphroditic i think it's very interesting because like we were even in a conversation the other day we were part of and it was like we were talking about the x and the y chromosome and how like the you know it's the same dictation as you have xx chromosome for female cannabis and you have xy chromosome for male cannabis and there, there's things like you can get these genetic testings now where you can cut, get a leaf cutting and send it in for testing and stuff like that i think that's awesome and there's some really cool businesses but it's it you, one uh, doctor and i forget who it was and it, it, the, the name is leaving me but he said he worded it best is there are no true males or females in cannabis while it is deployed in two sexes is that it's more of a it's more of a gray zone than people meander. There's always a way to reverse a plant from male to female or female to male through chemical, you know, stressors and stuff like that. So theoretically, they're all kind of hermaphroditic. You could have maybe a true male, but all females are able to become hermaphroditic in that process. So I think I, I always like people kind of shit on bag seed and I see where that comes from. 
Um, <laughs> but I also kind of go, you know what? Like there, it, there could be potential in that bag seed that was never there. If we didn't, if we didn't, if the guy who planted chem dog like seeds that was just bag seed, we wouldn't have like a lot of the stuff that's been bred through the chem line already. Like there, we wouldn't have a lot of this stuff if we didn't plant these bag seeds. So I, I don't have any disrespect for that. I think it's, it's honorable to do so, to be frank. Well, yeah, and most of the interesting expressions, like if you want to see a boring plant in or do true bread, right? Because you can only get so many possibilities out of it. Um, but having said that, I, you know, I just feel that responsibility to like stick to Gregor Mendel's breeding principles, right? Like the way that we breed plants and we do our selection has been around for 150 years, right? And and, and it works, right? Um, a couple of buddies that I have, they work for genetic mapping companies and they deal with cornfields in Iowa. And it's the corn farmers exactly the same way as like i am right like i don't rely on lab reports or coas to like tell me what this plant is going to do how it's going to perform what its medical efficacy is because i never had that opportunity to, to use that technology and i've had to train myself to be that computer and be like okay so web leaf non-web leaf you know purple over here so anthocyanins, right? Oh, I like this one because it's got creatine in it, right? Like stuff like that. So it's, and I also really find it funny that right now we're basing everything off of secondary metabolites, right? Because that's, that's where your flux can happen and it's not really consistent, right? You know, there is anecdotal evidence out there showing you know environmental mutation going on but for all intents and purposes cuts will grow similar to grower to grower right like there is variation that people see and talk about where the massive variation is is on that secondary metabolites like with the thc levels right because like you know humidity and the environment plays such a role in determining that right like i know if i grow in a 65 rh room my thc levels is going to be are going to be higher just because the plant's natural defense mechanism is to produce more trichromes to offset the relative humidity in that room Whereas if I grow at 35 or like, cause like mold spores won't clear, uh, like grow below 32% RH. So if I grow in a room that's below 32% RH, my yield's going to be about the same. I know I'm not good. Well, there might be mold, but I know it's not growing. The trade off is, is the THC levels are lower, but like for somebody like me, that doesn't really matter. Cause like I'm looking for, overall factors right like how easy was this plant to trim how quick did it grow you know like was it a beast on water or did it use like very little water right like those those are the sorts of things that i hunt for not secondary metabolites right because like yeah i'm guilty my stuff was 32 percent thc and i you know and then as soon as i was able to see and where that was and and you know uh the testing became more affordable and the home devices on the market became more reliable I was able to see well yeah i've got flowers that'll come out at 23 but out of that entire batch i'm only looking at 15 percent, right and then i go over here to this flower and it's only a 12 percent, but i like that flower more right so and it's and it's really is the primary metabol or like the primary metabolites and the things that you can visually see that are drawing me to that plant not as terpen profile well what i can smell yes five percent terps no that's not driving me to Yeah, and picking the like you like you mentioned, I think this is really interesting when you look at look at testing in a lot of places. If you can take like if you're just sending small sample testing, 
and you're using like top buds and the very crescendo stuff, your THC numbers are going to be a lot higher than if you're using mids and uh, not even mids or like stuff that's just below that, that still looks exactly the same, but isn't getting the same amount of reaction. Not, not, not to burst your bubble, but there's, there's lines out there where the inside flowers have more THC content. Right, so the smalls are what you want out of that particular strain. You don't want the you don't want the tops, you know, you know, or what everybody calls quads. You want the smalls, right? And uh, <laughs> guy who taught me when he first was teaching me how to trim, um, he's like, those little ones, those are yours. He's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, it's called the grower's smoke. He's like, why? He goes, because that's what the grower's stuck with, right? Now, 20 years later, you know, I know which one of my plants. I fucking love those popcorn buds, right? Because I know they're more, they have more THC, they have a better aroma, uh, right? Than, you know, the mass of flowers from it's all good weed, right? Like three years into legalization, uh, the consumer, even the new consumer, is uh, spotting issues and identifying issues is really easy to do um everybody's got that figured out what they haven't figured out is you know where on the plant and like there was one group that i was working with and they had no idea that it was like it could be 25 at the top and 10 at the bottom or you know it could be 10 at the top and then you get inside the plant and it's 25 right so there are lines that do that right Is it based like indica versus sativa? No, because it's kind of pretty much some indicas, the inside will be higher. Some sativas, the inside will be higher, right? So it's it's handy knowing those secondary metabolites in like that situation. But overall, really, it doesn't matter, right? (laughs) Like at all. Exactly. Oh, yeah. We're all okay. like we're all going for individual things. I think that's an interesting point that you you mentioned. The outliers that you specifically hunt for are stress induced outliers, like things that I like, like don't need very much water, but have a lot of growth rate. Um, don't have like that that are outlying not in effect of of terpene and and, and cannabinoid production, but actually on high stress stuff. Because I mean, really, when you look at it. The idea is to get cannabis in as many gardens as possible. And we, we've chatted about this whole thing. And we have a bunch of Canadians on here as well that can talk about how challenging it can be to grow in an outdoor environment here in Canada. So looking for outliers like that that would benefit this kind of a consumer, or not even consumer, but a, a group of people is, is highly advantageous. I mean, it, it, it's a great plan and, and structure to look at because it's something that can be very useful if we want to get people to be able to grow cannabis like you said i mean you say it's a small number to grow but i i think from from 12 to to 100 is is pretty exemplary growth over three years and and that it, it even like the little bit of growth and over time of more people growing at home I think is super critical and i think stuff like that is really important i know there's we, we've chatted with like jamie who's the nova scotia grower who has like an old um a pea, like a hash plant that he, he that's a auto flower variety that's been like bred to go really well out there and i think it's really interesting because it did super super well but i heard about somebody else growing it out in the prairies where it's dry and it just did atrociously because <laughs> it's just so dry and freaked out i had no idea what to do it's usually like nova scotia ocean climate um so I, I love that fact that you're looking for those outliers and, and the advantageous thing. Now, you, you do a little bit of project internationally and have done a, a few keynote speaking and stuff like that. But I don't want to jump into too much. We are getting to the hour and 10 minute point. And I think we're all getting a little bit of drain. So I want to lay it out one last opportunity to have everybody uh, ask their questions if they have anything and ask uh, David some questions beforehand. I will hop on to the Future Cannabis Project and see what's there. I got a great comment from JW. My theory is that buds are stinkiest before they are fully mature couch lock sometimes anyway. What do you find like, do you, because you we've talked about this before and this actually is a great segue into conversation. So thank you, JW. When it comes down to 
the freshness of a plant and the development of terpene and the profile there because you're kind of you like a, you don't mind trying it out a little bit fresh um and you like that like right fresh and dried cannabis or do you like like a weekend to cure like what is your favorite plant if you had the ideal plant the perfect plant other than you know easy more it, it, easy growing and stuff like that what would it be you know what would be the best plant for you uh something that flowers in six weeks and that you're getting that like one to 1. 1.5 watts or grams per watt guaranteed right um that that would be the perfect plant i don't enjoy <laughs> i know it sounds like i enjoy smoking something that's like 36 hours dried i don't enjoy it um ooh, i just do that so that i know like okay did i fuck this up right is it flushed right i, I think you could tell a lot at that point in time yeah like that that, <laughs> that first taste is this going like to hash great... yeah is this going to hash or is this going to be something that I don't want to necessarily phone in my cure, right? So <laughs> the first 36 hours, never enjoyable. Probably 10 days after dried, that's when I'm like, yeah, this, this is my prime spot up until about four months, right? And then from that four months down, that's kind of where I'm like, okay, so maybe I should make this into hash. Like, where am I going to put this next, right? Hash topicals, right? Garbage bin, you know. So, <laughs> well, where do you, where that do you doesn't store happen? It? Actually, Have you that thought does... about like a wine cooler for storing your your flour to see if you get more time out of it, like throwing it in like at four degrees Celsius after you've got it like at that perfect point, throwing it in there and seeing if you could drag that out a little bit longer by dropping I... that temp. Nope. I do not change my processes. I made the mistake of when legalization <laughs> happened, I listened to other people. And like, so I don't throw away weed like very often. Um, I've had, you know, I had a plant get hit with bud rot, threw that in the garbage. Uh, so, and then the second time it was, I was talking to an old timer and he was telling me how he cured and dried and it's like i i just don't know and like even when he showed me his weed i was like fuck this is pretty gross right so i turned around and i did his method and yeah sure as shit it molded in three days right so and that's like you know before legalization there wasn't very many pictures of what moldy weed looked like on the internet right so a lot of guys they had really bad really good growing practices but their packaging practices fucking sucked, right? Like curing in Ziploc bags. Like, you know, I, I, my, I've been doing things the way that I've been doing for, you know, close, close to two decades. I'm not changing it, right? I will never get rid of my mason jars. I love them, right? Even if I was like a big commercial producer, my staff would hate me because we'd be using mason jars with the lids, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, so, it, we, I mean, it's a vein of our existence here in Canada is mold. And it's, it's just a fear. Yeah. I think everybody's in a crowded building screaming fire when there is no fire. Um there, there, there was a case before the courts where a consumer received uh, contaminated product and it got dismissed because there was no harm, right? Yes, it causes, there, there's, you know, the whole, oh, moldy weed will do this, this, and this. But this one particular case, the, the judge said, you know, you failed to pr prove harm. And it was one of those situations, right? Oh, I smoked moldy weed. And like, and like the thing is, is for the last 80 years, somebody, everybody, you know, they've all had experience with moldy cannabis. Now people can recognize it a lot more. Um, there is a lot of education that's had to happen in that front. But it's kind of like when you go to the grocery store and you're buying grapes, right? I'm not. I have no idea about the great plant, but I know I can go into a grocery store and purchase something that isn't, it doesn't have mold, right? When I bring it home and I put it in my fridge, 
right? If they go bad, I can recognize that and I have no formal training, right? So I really think this whole mold argument, contamination argument within Canada is like, it's, it's people are failing to see the forest through the trees. It's, right? it's, it's a sidebar <laughs> when we're looking at other, when there's a lot bigger things to, to hash out and look at, pardon the pun. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just like, it, <laughs> uh, but, about puns. <laughs> but it's, it's right. Like it's one of those things that like we need that, that we often get segued on and, and focus on derivatively. I mean, if you look at parts per million in mold spores and what's going on, like, unless you have a HEPA filter in your home at all points in time, you're going to breathe in a, a volume of mold spores and spores through the air. It also, on, on top of that, too, you wonder what, like, the mitigation of completely voiding mold spores consumed through the air or through foods or contact in minor doses. I mean, we're finding out more and more each each year. Like we just found out about how important the, the gut bacteria biome is and how valuable that is for our health and how it can cause things like depression and major other disorders and stuff like that. So I think it's like we, we get this kind of point where like we get grossed out because of this stereotypical thought. Like we were talking about this yesterday. I use predatory insects and bugs freak the fucking shit out of me. <laughs> and they like, they do, they give me anxiety. Like they're not like great. They freak the hell out. is jumping on me from like round corners, like freaking ninjas. And it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. And I, I, but you have to create that mental, fo mental change It's like, Hey, is this, a, is this actually a bad thing? You know, because we could be by creating these overly clean or sterile environments, be taking out some of the very critical parts that we need to go. And there's like examples of it throughout nature, like mitochondria in the cell that are responsible for energy are so critical for the development of, uh, uh, of energy in the cell are in and absolutely every cell from plants to people to everything it's 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 in everything and they actually have their own floating dna and rna within mitochondria within the cell so it's like this was a separate bacteria at one point in time that had become so synonymous with living organism cell that it became one and has thus created like multicellular structures and now every organism on the earth that is living has cells that have mitochondria in them and, and I think it's just, there's this amazing unicity between like the plant and what we look at and what we're doing and these bacteria and these biomes. And like when we take these overly sterile things and really cut every part of it out, you know, what are we losing? You know, sure we can grow some really dope ass cannabis in a hydroponic system or aeroponic system and, and, and complete it in a sterile environment, maybe even grow it without beneficials, you know, and do that type of thing but in the long run is not having those bacteria inducing like almost like a hollow product is what i wonder and i've been perplexed by this over the last little while thinking about like when we feed things salt and don't have the like i don't think there's anything wrong with using salt in growth i think there's some things there's advantages and disadvantages that can be used if used appropriately like anything in life in the right volume it is correct but anyways I think there's an advantage to this kind of methodology of using bacteria and everything together because it's going to provide the diversity of things that we need to make us feel better and healthier. So like when we overwash our, don't get me wrong, wash your vegetables, people, please. But when you don't, when you go into your yard and you're going through your garden and you, you have a very clean and everything's perfect and taken care of, you don't need to take your carrot out of the ground, scrub it with a, like a crazy brush and like make sure everything's off of it and like put it in bleach water like you don't need to do that like that that it's healthy for you, you can pull it out of the ground run it under your hose and eat the damn carrot and it's going to have a lot of good things for it and i think that the same can be said kind of in cannabis maybe not don't don't smoke moldy cannabis everybody but you know don't be as fearful i think of bacteria i think is really important and that's my point i'm sorry about a little bit of a rant there david but i got to no, yeah, and I agree with you 100%. Um, what, what I would like to see is, you know, some of these herbicides and pesticides that are approved, you know, they, they take a second look at it now, you know, because some of the stuff that is approved and that people use, not within cannabis, I'm, I'm talking all plants, 
um, you've got some pretty sketchy shit going on there and like the bees, right? So you, you look at what's happening to the bee population and that should be our very first indicator of what needs to change and where the problem really is, right? A little bit of mold, you can recognize that. Uh, the human eye can see down to uh, 32 microns, right? So uh, there are there are a few people that I know that uh, they've taken you know that 32 micron visible mold spore, and it panned out to about 18,000 coliformed units. Now some licensed producers out there are allowed to have 100,000 CFU per gram. Right. So, and it just, it's all dependent on what pharmacopoeia these guys pick. Cucumber producers aren't put through the ring or anything like that. Like, there, there is no other uh, herbal product or vegetable on the planet that's, that's kind of treated like this. Um, in Saskatchewan, uh, the way that it works is uh, anything that's below 0.85 water activity. Is, or, you know, and from this column, which includes herb, dried herbs, is deemed low risk, right? So that means that you can just, it's a free and open market, okay? Cannabis, it's an herb. Its water activity is below 0.85, right? And really, you want to be below 0.59, like, and like, really, you can err on the side of caution, and it can be bone dry and used for whatever. But it's just really, it's to me, it doesn't seem rational that they they put it into its own category and things, right? So, like, I'm hoping in the next 20 years, you know, actual botanists and actual scientists get in on writing the regulations so that the market can go, right? The access can go to where it's intended to be, right? Same thing with carrots. Right, carrots have medical benefit. I can go get carrots anywhere I like, right? Buy them from whoever I want. Um, the risk there is the pesticide use and the herbicide use. And you know, if they're if, if some of those products that were you know they're designed to kill, right? Yeah, it's the whole right? the whole spray zone, I think, is we we. I think the whole pesticide, the air, the idea of pesticides and these chemical sprays that we're using were like technologies created with partial knowledge. You know what I mean? Like we're like when it comes down to our accumulative natural intelligence, when pesticides were creative, we were on the evolutionary scale of my three year old daughter of intelligence. You know what I mean? Like when it comes down to our actual understanding, like we had just invented, we're, we're just figuring out the electron microscope, you know, at the atom at that point. Like we, we were like, I mean, we're bad. We we're definitely past. Sorry. That's a little, my, my timeframes are a little bit fucked up there, but you know, like we had just really learned about these things. We're talking about the cannabinoid system as being like discovered in the 1990s. Like we have such a, a limited view and all of these technologies that we had were created with this very, like very narrow minded, very small look of things. And I'm really excited because there's so many technologies and methodologies of people developing things, especially in the cannabis space, because we've always kind of been these, like we like we talked about before, the anti-heroes. We've got Jason Gideon, for example, in the crowd, who is a KNF guy, brews a ton of his own inputs and does a ton of his own stuff. We actually have him coming up on our episode on the 26th, which is pretty cool. And and these nutrient companies and stuff, like that, they, they build these plans and stuff. Sorry, I've completely segue because I saw your beautiful face, Jason. I'm I, I'm very apologetic for that, but we we kind of had this this partial view of what these chemicals were doing and how safe they were. Like, sure, we could grow a carrot without with just salts, you know. Sure, we could grow a carrot with just salt in an inert medium that isn't soil. But like the diversity of what's accumulated in that product is so different i think than what we see than what we actually see because we're just we're only able to see this far at that point in time we, we need to look back at this stuff and see what's actually going on right 
Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's why the bees matter, right? Like uh, we plant, well, we don't even plant sunflowers anymore. They're just feral now. Um, and so my yard's always loaded up with them. But if you go a mile down the road, you know, there isn't a bee in sight, right? So it, uh, something's got to change there. Right. I'm a huge fan. Like, uh, you know what the it, you know, one of the things is, is like, for example, Elysium, and it's just these crazy little things. Like, Elysium is this like highly advantageous cover crop that just grows like nuts. I don't even know. Am I pronouncing it right? You probably know better. Alysium, A L Y S U M. Yes. Elysium. Elysium. Um, sorry, guys. It says it's like kind of looks like baby breath, but not really. It's a lot smaller. But these like are highly advantageous like predator bugs that defend um, crops, harvest and, and plant their eggs in them. They're in oh, advantageous space yeah. for that. Like, and you can, and this stuff is just like, and it's just flat. It's a plant that's just all little white flowers. And it's just like bees love it. They come to it. There's all sorts of other pollinators. And I think you're pointed out something interesting, but I also want to put a sidebar out is that there's like tons of other micro pollinators out there as well that are just as important into the ecosystem that aren't being looked at at all, that are having just as much troubles because they're like, there's tiny little flowers that bees can't get into, right? And they, you need these little tiny smaller pollinating plants pollinating mites and and little flies to to take care of that stuff so it's such an important ecosystem and the bees are just like they're that big big sign in the middle of it that says hey there's something fucking going wrong here yeah <laughs> that's absolutely true but yeah david i think this is an excellent point for us to kind of sum up and end our day i don't know about you but i'm tired and excited and i've had a lot of fun enjoying this conversation did was it survivable did you enjoy it damon i didn't make yeah it. i didn't i didn't have to yeah <laughs> absolutely it was a lot of fun awesome well i appreciate it brother do you want to just give people a shout out let them know where to find you at and then uh, we'll, i'll shut down the room um yeah i'm Fairly, uh, like I've got an Instagram account that I use that I just post bullshit to have fun. Uh, really made a lot of good friends over, you know, the last three years running it. So that's Damon at Kara's. And then I'm on here with you guys Tuesday nights. And then my LinkedIn profile, right? So it's Damon Giesbrecht on LinkedIn. And yeah, that's that's where to find me. Sorry, I, you just, I know <laughs> I have, I have, I I'm there. I, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks again for checking it out and being here and, and, and jumping on board to a, the dank hour. So you guys can catch Damon and the rest of the crew of the dank hour. Um, and what's going on there. Jolly, who is messaging me in the background. We love you. You're one of our major fans that come back. Yeah, we're going to cut it a little bit short, but we are going to be talking about organic, horticulture very very soon we have a lot of fun stuff coming up on the dank hour eh, damon we have some big names showing up um joshua steen's land dutch blooms are coming in as guest speakers so don't forget to click the little greenhouse on the top top click haters follow them you know check them out check out their backs and their instagrams and all that lovely stuff so that you can get in on that and jolly like we're gonna have some amazing names so i expect some great notes and some awesome questions coming up for those episodes as well as jason's one next week okay brother uh, and i appreciate everybody keep it growing and thanks again for future cannabis project and peter and everybody out there in the world wide web enjoying this great show and thanks again damon i appreciate it hey thanks to future cannabis project thanks to you london um, since like I told you yesterday, what you're doing here has alleviated a lot of work for a lot of people. So keep up the hard work, brother. I, I am just happy to support the community and help Peter with the production over at Future Cannabis Project and just kind of get the, out there. I think the cannabis space, like we've spoken about before, and like we talked in depth yesterday, like the cannabis space, especially with all these big corporate conglomerates and these problematic sources as, as individuals, we 
are but a drop in a pool of water, but as a community and as a team, together we can amount and it succeed with a lot more. And there's amazing um, you know, community leaders like yourself, the Dankauer crew, everybody that's on there, but also Future Cannabis Project who's producing and helping us get this content out there and helping me get the word out there to share. So thank you guys again. And before I get sappy, I'll just end this, end it all now. So appreciate, not end it all, that sounded worse. Um, end the show now. Thanks guys, my friend.